My name is Rachel Stein. I'm the director of Book Abundance at Book Harvest, located in Durham, North Carolina. And we've been talking so far about, um, you know, sorting and acquiring books and all of the processes. And that tour was just awesome with Colleen. And now we're going to shift into talking about, well, how do we provide these books? How do we provide them to children and families? And so for this um, panel, we are going to be talking about bookmobiles and different um, organizations that have vehicles. And so um, I'm going to kick it off um, with passing it to Rowan, who can just introduce yourself, provide an overview of your organization and the programming. And then as you introduce yourself, I believe that Kelly is going to be showing a picture of your vehicle. So you can kind of talk us through a little bit about your vehicle. Um, and so Rowan, start us. Hi, good morning. Uh, Rowan Childs from Madison Reading Project. We're in Wisconsin. Um, we have an awesome bookmobile. Let's see it. There it is. <laughs> um, and one of our staff members, Natalie. Um, we've had our bookmobile since 2019. Um, it's sort of the equivalent of a small sprinter van and the door sort of fully opens up there in the middle um, and it has a full wooden interior uh, with custom shelves and it is out on the road nearly every day, mostly due to Wisconsin weather. Most of the child related visits happen between April to November. Um, but we use it all throughout the winter as well for all kinds of pickups and deliveries. And I think we will never go back to not having vehicles. Um, and if anything, we're actually in the process of working towards a second. That is very exciting. Thank you, Rowan. Okay, next let's um, move to Elizabeth. Please introduce yourself and show us, to tell us a little bit about your vehicle. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Draga. I'm the founder and executive director of The Book Truck, and we focus exclusively on teen literacy outreach. Uh, so we only work with teenagers, and um, this is our book truck. Uh, we use the truck. It's a Ford Transit Connect. Um, we are based in, we're headquartered in Long Beach. Uh, we serve all of LA County, so we do benefit uh, from the California weather. So our um, setup is kind of like a pop-up uh, book fair almost. We have two library carts that come out of the back of the truck. You can see that we have shelving where the door opens and then we usually also set up tables uh, of books as well. Wonderful, thank you, Elizabeth. Mark, let's go to you. My name is Mark Firing. I'm with the Maryland Book Bank, executive director. Um, we've had a relationship with the Baltimore Ravens where they bought us two bookmobiles. The first one was about seven years ago, and the second one was in 2019. Um, it cost about $67,000 full all in, custom built for us. Um, yeah, and then uh, maintaining it is easy. They were both new vehicles, so that wasn't difficult. And uh, basically, our only pain point with this thing is, is making sure that we have a driver for it. So we have a new crew from AmeriCorps that's in, all of whom uh, wanted to drive it. We have four of them who are actually sitting in it now. Uh, they're working on it as we speak. And it'll go out every day, and in some cases, twice a day to deliver a home library program. Um, and these also go out to events, uh, book festivals, whatnot, even the farmer's market uh, to let people showcase what we do. Wonderful, thank you, Mark. Michael. Yes. Um... I'm Michael Shipley with Book Book Go, and uh, we've had our bookmobile since 2018. We purchased a uh, Ram ProMaster. We actually had to do a lot of searching for one that was six and a half feet high, so I could stand in it, um, of course, and uh, and the rest of people. And then that the go on it. We um, you walk into the to the uh, the bookmobile, and you you see the open faced concept where we have plexiglass bins that we made, so the children are kind of walking in and, and they can see the book jackets right away, just pop up. And um, and then we have another shelf that holds about a thousand books on the left. And uh, it fits about in, um, six or seven kids comfortably with a couple parents or teachers um, to help pick up books, pick out books. And it, uh, it, it works perfectly for what we use it for. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for those intro introductions. And now I want to dive a little bit deeper into the, uh, the talking about the vehicles. Um, thank you for those pictures because it does show how unique and how different the vehicles are, as well as each of these organizations are in different places in the United States. Um, so for, for people who are on this call today and are considering what it would be like to actually move forward and have a vehicle, I would love for you just to tell us, you know, how did you acquire it? How much did it cost? What are some of the pain points? How do you maintain it? Like, what does an organization need to start putting into place in order to purchase a vehicle? Um, and I know, Mark, you, you touched a little bit on this, but if there is more to add, um, please feel free to do that. We'll start with you, Michael, for that question. Um, our boat wheel costs about $25,000. Um, we, we kind of sourced it through, um, I don't know, just a little people, if you know, a car dealer, they, a lot of them use Mannheim auto auctions and, um, you, you, you know, your dealer can look for a specific, uh, a specific vehicle and search and, and ours actually came out of Pennsylvania with like 3000 miles. So you, you know, we're in St. Louis, Missouri. So, you know, you can, um, source a, a, a vehicle that way. Um, and then. Uh, the, the cost was uh, to outfit was about $5,000 and we had a, a retired um, woodworker carpenter um, and we, we purchased the materials, dropped it off at the workshop. And, and, uh, you, you know, there's major marketing companies you can go to, to, um, to outfit a bookmobile or a, a book truck or a book van. Um, but just as a small nonprofit, you have to be nimble. And that's kind of what we did to come up with our bookmobile. Fantastic. Um, Mark, is there anything you want to add from what you shared previously? Um, well, basically, one of the important things that we had were relationship with the foundations, and they had the relationship with the Ravens, who were looking at giving money. So we said, what about a bookmobile instead? It's a marketing scheme. So you can put their brand on it, and they'll pay for it. So that's something to keep in mind as you're going through and thinking about this. It's, it's not just for your brand. It can be for someone else's, and that can afford you a pretty nice vehicle very easily. Um, they paid for the whole thing. They helped with all of the branding on it. They did all the artwork for our specs. We told them just go ahead and do whatever you like with it. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. I mean, it's it, it been something that we knew we needed to have 10 to 15 kids on. So that's why we went with a larger vehicle. They wanted us to use a transit initially at the dealership. Um, but then when we started talking to them about what we wanted to do, the goals for the program and the fact that long-term, we wanted to have so many children on it. We needed something a bit bigger, which is why we went with the custom truck. Wonderful. And um, thank you for that example of that unique partnership with the Ravens. Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your vehicle. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we worked with an individual funder who was interested in sort of um, starting and funding the whole project with us. We bought a new Ford Transit Connect um, in 2013, which at the time was about $26,000. Uh, and then we worked with a van conversion company to build out the inside and we purchased the library carts and sort of how that was gonna be loaded and all that kind of stuff. We worked um, with the van conversion company on. Um, we knew that I was going to be driving it around and LA, you know, is sort of notorious for terrible traffic. Uh, so we wanted something that was going to be really nimble and flexible. Um, we had, in terms of partners, we were working with everything from high schools to group homes. And so we wanted something that we knew um, we could get into a number of different types of locations fairly easily. So that's why we ended up going with a smaller vehicle. Um, and yeah, now we are also able to use it for transporting, um, in addition to doing events, we also deliver boxes of books so we can take the carts out and use the truck for the box deliveries and all that kind of stuff as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth and Rowan. Yeah. Um, similarly, we purchased a van. It was a couple of years old. Um, we did have a little bit of trouble even back then um, with vet commercial vans just being available because usually when people do have them, they hold on to them for a long time. So 
It did take us a little bit of time to find one that had low mileage um, and was completely empty. And then we worked and found um, one of our corporate sponsors is also a construction company. So they donated all of their labor and materials to make a wooden interior for us. Um, but that worked out um, really well. And likewise with the branding, I can't say enough about having um, your nonprofit's name and what you do on the outside of the bus. Um, that's something we talk a lot about pre before the bus where we were trying to do, bring books out to community centers or schools. Um, and we were relying on employee vehicles and how many boxes of books can you fit into someone else's vehicle and then just showing up um, and immediately everybody knowing that you're there. Um, and it creates that instant party or sort of really fun book fair atmosphere pretty much immediately. Um, and that's been amazing. And then having our donors, our large donors are on the outside of the bus. So they are getting that recognition as well. And they definitely see that when they come out and visit us or people take photos and then their names are on all of our photos <laughs> or a lot of them. Um, so that initial buy-in I think has paid off dramatically for some of those large donors um, because their, their name is driven all around town. Um, I'm just trying to think as far as other expenses, the other thing that we took is just into consideration because we didn't have a vehicle before was just sort of the expense of having additional staff out on the road the whole time. How many books potentially would we would we be giving out? So just adding all of that on as our budget. And then we created a two-year budget initially just to sort of try and sort of foresee what other additional costs we might have. But the actual maintenance and things like that isn't too bad because we don't, we it is out on the road a lot, um, but it's not putting on a ton of miles. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you all for that. So we've talked a little bit more about the actual vehicles and now let's talk about, well, what do these vehicles allow for your organization to do in terms of programming? And so we'll have Michael and Elizabeth answer that question. You know, what, what programming opportunities have come to you because you have this vehicle? Michael, why don't you start us off? Um, I think it's one, one uh, niche that we've found in the last year or two is uh, the rural school districts um, and communities don't necessarily have access to bookmobiles in Missouri and Illinois. And so, of course, of course, we support, we've been supporting the urban areas since 2018 with our bookmobile, but there's a big need in the, the rural community. So I, I think all a, a lot of the, um, you know, just because you're in the, a major city doesn't mean you can't reach out. So um, to and, and this allows the vehicle, obviously, to drive to those places like Poplar Bluff, Missouri, um, Livingston County, Missouri, like all these places that are, you know, four or five hours away, we've gone to for book events. And uh, yeah, that's wonderful. So you've really been mm -hmm. able to expand your reach beyond where your physical location is because of this vehicle. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Um, Elizabeth, what would you like to add to that in terms of programming? Yeah, so for us, the biggest, the sort of game changer is that it really allows us to meet the teens where they're at. Um, so from a lot of the kids that we've talked with, there's some apprehension or maybe like a feeling of overwhelm going into like a public library for the first time if they didn't grow up going there. Uh, so the fact that we're able to actually bring the vehicle and set up in a school or at a community fair where they're going to be already um, helps us reach uh, you know, just significantly more kids than we would be able to reach otherwise. Well, and I love that idea of you're creating a different environment than a library or a school setting um, because of the vehicle. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, so these are wonderful positives and I've heard a lot of like, oh, it's so great to have a vehicle. But let's get real for just a moment. And what are the pain points? What have been the challenges? What has been difficult? What can you help others on this call avoid um, before they do this? And so Rowan, let's start with you. What are some of the, the pain points? 
Yeah, um, I think there isn't a huge amount of pain points for us. Definitely the first time around um, when we were doing this, um, we weren't sure. We had a good idea that everyone would obviously want to participate in that with our program partners and as more people became aware of it. Um, but do, um, I think, definitely try and plan out as much as possible that everybody will want to contact you and be part of that. So coming up with a plan ahead of time how do people book the bus? How do people get a hold of you? What are the rules? Um, trying to sort of think that all through would be really helpful. Um, the other thing with ours, and I think some of the similar one, similar other buses too, is you do need to be able to step up into the bus, um, which most children or adults are able to, but realize that not everybody might might be able to do that or just um, some people still have that sort of stranger danger uh, scenario. They don't know you, even if it is a branded vehicle. So some people will still want you to bring the books out to them or the bring the book carts or boxes out as well and make it a friendly atmosphere no matter what. Um, and then I think just some of the other things as far as some people had just messaged about liability or insurance, making sure your insurance agent knows exactly what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it is very clear uh, what is happening, um, setting up all those sort of, you know, any, any scenarios you can think ahead of time and letting people know when you're going to be there, you know, how much room you need to have, um, where can you park, where do you not want to park, um, you know, all of the safety precautions around bringing, you know, orange cones with you and all of that so you're not creating any kind of dangerous situation for kids in a parking lot or on a street. Thank you, because that just, it, I think you bring up a lot of things that people need to think about before doing this, some of the logistics around it. Um, Elizabeth, Michael, or Mark, anything to add to that question? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, I would just say, I would just say, you know, rem, uh, just remembering to stay flexible. I know we initially had um, the library cards went into the van on the initial build with um, a ramp, and then we ultimately ended up building a, or putting in a wheelchair lift to lift the carts up. So, you know, um, I think. I think probably everyone has experience having to do like certain upgrades over time. Um, so just, you know, being being aware that you may need to kind of make changes as as the sort of programming dictates. And I will say regarding the liability issues, um, you know, our our liability insurance did go up pretty significantly once we added the van. Um, so, you know, just working with a with a carrier, as Rowan said, to sort of let them know specifically what you're doing. Thank you. That's helpful too. Michael, did you want to add to that? I was just going to say, as an as an organization, you know, if you're giving away 800 books at, at an event or you know at a four hour time span at a at a school, because it takes about 20 minutes for about 20 kids to filter through the bus to pick up uh, six books or whatever we're doing that day. And so you got to remember, if you have a, an event the next day, you got to you got to stock it with 800 more books, and you have to sort them, and you have to be organized, and you have to be ready to go, and even vacuuming and things like that to keep it keep it going. So, um, in our situation, we give away new books, and so you know it just takes a little, lot of time to be ready for the next day. So, I mean, as your organization thinks about purchasing a book and be able to keep all these little things in mind. Thank you for that. Um, so. When you're doing this programming and these different things that you're doing because of your vehicle, of course, we know that there's data to track and there's evaluation and there's funders that want to know, well, why does this matter? So um, Mark, I'd love to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about how do you evaluate the effectiveness of the programming that you provide because of the vehicles? Okay. Um, basically, we're gonna track the number of children we serve uh, how many of them are Title I, which is virtually all of them for the home library program, how many books go out. Um, and then we also have a survey that goes out to the parents, the caretakers, and the teachers as well to try and get their feedback so we understand enthusiasm, et cetera. Do, do, their, do they become better readers? Are they reading more often? What's the effect on them emotionally? Um, so we're getting some sort of feedback that way. And when we talk about it, we use several studies that show 
you know, the effectiveness of distributing books to children. The main point for the bookmobiles is that there's a, a, the element of choice. So we have, we can put 3,500 books at a time on this truck. It goes out once to 400 kids and it's virtually empty. So we've got to get it back in and sort it out again. So we started actually sorting by topic on the bookmobile, um, which is affording these kids an even greater choice. The fun part is there's an equity issue. As you're seeing some of the children selecting books, of course, Baltimore, Maryland is predominantly an African-American city. Um, we try to put as many books as possible on there, you know, to cater to that community so that they see themselves. But they're also getting books that they would normally, you know, they're, they're expensive. They're $10, $15 a piece that the children are able to get. And so we really opened up some things that way to the community. And it's, and it's made it, you know, easier for us to track what we're doing. We know that 3,500 books, we've got each child getting 10 books a piece. That makes it easier for us to track when we know exactly how many books are going to each child and we go twice a year to them. That's something that funders love. So creating this home library, it's an out of school program, which is also key that a lot of people are funding now, um, as well as giving us money to purchase, specifically purchase books for children of color so that we're able to purchase some of the books we put on. We don't put anything on there that's a library book. Um, so we're able to track that as well as just the number of books that are going out. But it's been pretty, pretty easy for us so far. And and you mentioned parent surveys. How do you get the parents that survey and how do you get that survey back from them? Each child gets a bag when they go on to the bookmobile to fill with the 10 books. In that bag is going to be a bookmark, some reading tips, and the survey. And we'll tell them, please tell your parents to go ahead and fill this out. And it's not, it's done by QR code so they can scan it and instantly just fill it out. So we make it as easy as possible for everybody. That's also on the bookmobile in general. So people can fill out stuff, the teachers. We track that. Wonderful. Thank you. Rowan, what would you add um, in terms of data and evaluation for your program? Yes, yeah, similar. We have a lot of uh, similar data collection to Mark. Um, just a couple of other things that we're also tracking, or probably Mark as well, is just sort of how many miles per year are we putting on the vehicle? Um, we also try and track to any repetitive stops. So we definitely have places that we might go every month. Um, some of our partners we might visit twice a month um, or twice a year. So we try and keep track of that, especially at the end of the year for just our impact report, letting um, some of our donors or our partnerships know like this is how many times we came out to you and or this is how many books sort of approximately as a whole that we have been giving to each of those organizations, um, which does come in handy, you know, pot potentially depending on what kinds of grants and requests that we're getting. Um, but otherwise, very similarly to that, we do have a teacher test, a uh, teacher survey that we send out, but I love the idea about trying to get some parent testimonials and surveys too. Wonderful, and Mark, a question for you. Um, someone was curious as to what percentage of surveys do you get back? Well, we just started asking for them and the parent surveys, it looks like it's maybe 20%. So I was pretty impressed by that. Um, very happy. Uh, I think the more we drill it into the kids' heads and the, and the teachers are also following up with it, the more we're getting back. So it's worked out. That well. is really high. Yeah. I, that's incredible, actually. And is there any incentive for the parents like, is there a drawing or anything like that? No, but we certainly incentivize the teachers. If, if they want a, uh, to participate in the home library program, there is a sign-on that they have to do so that, and one of the parts of that is that they will fill out the survey before and after. So we're not just getting one survey from them, we're getting several. So we're tracking how well the kids are doing um, and if the program has any impact. So we're getting that. So we, we put that into, into grants that we write. Um, as as a, as a little uh, an index or an addendum at the end to show them some of the, the feedback that we're getting from the teachers and from the parents. Wonderful. And, and from what you had said, it sounds like the survey is digital because it's with a QR code. And um, there is a request from the chat for you sharing the survey. So I'll let that, maybe you can share that with Amy and she can share that with the rest of the, um, confer the conference attendees after today, if that's something you're willing to do. Um, and the last question I would love for you all to answer is, is there any other thing you want people to know about this as they consider doing this? Is there any advice? 
Is there a story you want to share or just something you want to leave the group with today? And we'll start with you, Michael. Um, I just say it's another opportunity uh, for partnerships. You know, being mobile, you know, you're, you're able to go out to see big, more groups of people. And um, one thing about to keep in mind for Bookmobile is I like to explain it gives kids a choice. Some, some children that we, who we um, give books to have never been in a bookstore. You know, so it, it helps that child have a choice of what book they want to read. And, um, and hopefully there's something in the book wheel that they want to read. And uh, the other thing is we, we did have a home library program uh, pre, pre-COVID and we gave away a thousand um, wooden book boxes. And we, we partnered with a local woodworkers guild and they made these, they bring the book, the book boxes home and they make little wooden boxes to start a home library. So when Mark was talking about home libraries, there's such a need. Oh, sorry. There's such a need for um, home libraries. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> and thank, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Okay. That's great. Mark, one last thing for you to add, and we have you have about 30 seconds. Oh, no, I'm I'm good. I didn't uh, echo we're going with Adam, sorry. Okay. Elizabeth, what would you like to end with? Um, I would say, uh, I just wanted to add, somebody had asked about kind of maintenance, et cetera, those types of costs. And um, actually, surprisingly, you know, regular oil changes, but it, it hasn't been terribly expensive to maintain, you know, because it's not, it's traveling relatively locally. So in terms of gas uh, and maintenance, it, it, it's been, you know, obviously the initial investment was the real pain point. But after that, um, it's been pretty um, pretty affordable to upkeep. Wonderful. And Rowan? Yeah, the one thing um, similarly would be just really providing that amazing reading experience and just that whole part of being able to enter the bus. And it's, you know, like that magical sort of book fair moment. It's very similar um, and giving kids that opportunity that they don't usually get to have. So um, we Definitely, that's something we focus on a lot. And then I would say at this point, the bookmobile is in people's mind as soon as they, they say our organization's name. Um, so they just correlate book bus with our organization. So we, we only see that as a plus. That is, that's a huge plus and that's wonderful. Thank you so much to each one of you, Rowan, Elizabeth, Mark, and Michael for being on this panel and for telling us all more about bookmobiles. Hi everyone, welcome back. We're ready to get started on our second panel. And this is a panel discussion about providing books to same children and families for multiple years. And I am so excited um, about this panel. And I think you're gonna really get some fantastic ideas of how you can add some programming into um, your some of the organizations that you're part of. Um, so let's start off with having each panelist just please provide your name, your or, the name of your organization, and a brief overview of the program that you're going to be talking about today during our time together. And um, let's start with um, Amber. My name is Amber Smith. I'm the Executive Director at Family Reading Partnership. We're a small 25 year old nonprofit that serves a single county in upstate New York. We have a whole bunch of programs. The one I'm talking about today is our Books to Grow On program, which distributes brand new books to children via their medical providers and schools from before birth through age five. Wonderful. And next, let's go to Pam. Hi, my name is Pam Katinsky. I work for Read to Grow. Um, we're a small nonprofit in Connecticut. Um, we service all of Connecticut. We have many programs within our um, within Read to Grow. Um, ideally, we have um, a Welcome to the World book that we give to all new moms in the state of Connecticut that um, have a baby within one of our 14 hospitals in the state of Connecticut. Wonderful, thank you. And next, Allie, your turn. Hi, everyone. I am Allie Ferry. I'm a program manager with Spread the Word Nevada. We are located right outside of Las Vegas. 
Um, I am here specifically to talk about our readers and training program. And what that is, is that is a birth up to age five program that we started a little over a year ago. Um, we have a private Facebook page for all of the families that we work with to get on and learn some pre-literacy skills as well as preschool and kindergarten readiness. Uh, we do monthly virtual check-ins about our skill of the month. We do quarterly play groups so families can get together. And we also send out a brand new age appropriate book to the home of every child that is in our program every month they're in our program. Fantastic, thank you, Ali. Emily. Hi everybody, I'm Emily from Bookspring in Austin, Texas. Uh, we have a fairly well-established local program in Central Texas where we do books through schools and medical clinics and community groups. But about a year ago, we started a program um, with, uh, in collaboration with the state and the Texas Association for the Education of Young Children called Books Beginning at Birth. And this is a program where we are enrolling families um, online or over the phone and we will be distributing um, books to them every six months from birth to until they age out at age four. So we have a website. We also have a series of video tips that we've provided for them. Um, Connie, who is also here today, has launched Zoom Story Time so that we can engage the families in a weekly story time. We have a whole online uh, suite of books and uh, that they can access anytime for free. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our first year and we've enrolled 10,000, almost 10,000 children in the program so far. So it's exciting. It's big. It's we're building it as we're flying, but it's it's and we have a good evaluation, which we'll talk about as we go forward. Incredible. Thank you, Emily. Maytal. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maytal Barak. I'm the director of early literacy at Book Harvest, uh, an organization, nonprofit organization based in North Carolina. We have a robust uh, portfolio of programs, and today I'll be highlighting Book Babies. Um, it is a home visiting program that partners with families of Medicaid eligible children to develop their child's early language and literacy skills starting at birth. Um, and we begin when a baby is born. Uh, coaches provide quarterly literacy home visits, a total of at least 100 age appropriate new culturally responsive books, both in English and Spanish and essential supports for the transition to school uh, in pre-K and kindergarten enrollment. Wonderful. So first of all, let's just acknowledge, wow, these programs are incredible. They're amazing. And um, just the overview, I know we could probably spend the rest of today just talking about the nuts and bolts of each of these programs, but let's just try to cover a little bit for now and to sort of whet people's appetite. They can always reach out to you after this, um, but Tell us a little bit more about the, the parents that are signing up for your programs, are eligible for your programs, and how they are referred. And for that, Maytal, let's start with you. Yes, so uh, we have wonderful partnerships with um, health systems, community organizations, and programs. Uh, we receive referrals via these partnerships. Um, examples of this are uh, community health clinics, pediatric clinics, um, the nurse uh, programs like the Family Connects uh, International Program uh, based here in North Carolina, and also families encouraged to self-refer. So they can always go on our website and refer themselves. Uh, the program has been um, offered in Durham, uh, North Carolina for um, about 10 years now. And so families refer each other and neighbors and friends. Um, the criteria for eligibility is very simple. Newborns need to be Medicaid eligible, leave in the county where the program is offered, and they need to be younger than 16 weeks to allow for those quarterly visits um, starting that first year of the program. Wonderful, thank you, Maytal. Emily, tell us a little bit about how um, parents are referred to your program. Yeah, we because we had this great partnership with the Texas Association for the Education of Young Children, which is our Texas of, uh, part of the national affiliation, the national association that 
kind of accredits childcare centers, we were able to do a lot of webinars directly with their membership. So we worked out through the childcare centers to get directly to the families. We also did a model where we did a one-time book distribution with a lot of those partners as a way to kind of encourage and build trust with the families for them to apply directly to us. Um, we have a, a JOT form that's HIPAA compliant. So, um, and it's very low, low weight in terms of entering the data. Um, so we, we are kind of qualifying people once they enroll. In Texas, we have to have it be in what's called an economic opportunity zone, or we're supposed to focus on economic opportunity zones because Texas is a very big place, right? So um, we're doing that. We crosswalked it onto zip code, onto county, and then we're doing all our outreach and marketing. We have done radio and television to get the word out and billboards. So we're really targeting it in these specific areas so we can try to get at the children who really need it the most. Fantastic. Allie. So all of our other programs are actually elementary school based. So a lot of the initial parents that we got into this um, are sibling, like, <laughs> uh, um, kids who are already in our other programs. Um, we've also worked a lot with other nonprofits in the Vegas area doing similar work, um, as well as recently we've been working a lot with libraries. Um, so we've been able to go to a few of the library branches during their story times to kind of get the word out about this program to the people that are there, as well as obviously we're starting to develop um, some word of mouth, which is really fun to see. Wonderful. Thank you, Allie. Pam. Hi, our program is a little different. Um, our program with the Books for Babies, our, we have a prenatal program where we're in nine um, clinics in the state of Connecticut and the nurses actually, when the parents go in, when the moms, before they even have the baby, um, they're going in for the prenatal visits, they're getting handed a literacy packet that has all their information in it from Read to Grow. So they're starting off before birth and then we follow them. They get two packets, two sessions during their visits with their prenatal um, provider. And then later we're hoping I think Pam froze, so we're going to move on to Amber. Amber, tell us a little bit about how families are referred to you and um, some of those partnerships that help with the referrals. Yeah, so Books to Grow On is actually a program that goes out to every single family that lives in our county, so there is no referral. Um, it's an automatic enrollment, um, and we don't keep enrollment uh, data. We know how many children are in the county, and we know what practices um, how many uh, patients practices are seeing, but we don't know exactly how many families are in the program at any given time. Uh, it starts with an OB or midwife visit where they receive um, a book uh, called Read to Me in either Spanish or English. And uh, then we work with the hospital's uh, birthplace as well as another birth center in the community. And then every single pediatric or family uh, practice that sees uh, patients for pediatric well visits. So straight through from that first couple of days after birth, all the way up through age four. And then we partner with every school district in the county to do a welcome to school book when they arrive in kindergarten. Um, so really we are serving every single child in the county with this program, which is Wonderful. about 5,000 kids. Okay, county. great. Th thank you, Amber. Um, and for this next question, we were gonna focus a little bit more on some of the unique partnerships Pam, is there anything that you want to add to um, just what a little bit of what you started with? What is a unique partnership that your um, program um, collaborates with? We have many different partnerships. So we have our, our nine um, clinics in the state of Connecticut that we do, that we partner with um, before the baby is born. And then we have our 14 hospitals in the state of Connecticut where everyone gets a book, our Welcome to the World book that is written just for Read to Grow. Um, we also, from there, we also have um, children that, um, we have coordinators that meet with um, children in the, in the schools um, at in Bridgeport and New Haven, we have um, where they're providing services with them, giving them books. And we also have um, our Books for Kids program where parents can go online and they can um, sign up for free books to be mailed to their homes. Um, so we follow children from before they're born all the way until they're in high school. 
So, and we have many different providers and organizations that we partner with where we service and we send them um, maybe a thousand books they can request. They can request up to 20 books for their classrooms. It could be just an organization that's having an event. Um, we also have our bookmobiles. So there's lots of different ways that we can reach out to people in the state of Connecticut. Um, that's just phenomenal that you follow um, children for, for that long, actually starting before birth, um, like you talked about, incredible. Yeah. Amber, is there anything else you wanted to add in terms of unique partnerships? No, I think just that we are very fortunate to have really good relationships with the medical providers locally. Um, those pediatric clinics do a lot of work on our behalf. Um, we do all the delivering of the books to those partnerships, but they are the ones that put them into children's hands. So we're, we work with about 17 different locations locally um, and are sending books out constantly to them. It's wonderful. And it just speaks to the fact that these programs can't exist in isolation. They have to have those partnerships and how important it is to develop those partnerships and really tend to those relationships. Let's talk a little bit about measuring impact and evaluation. Um, you know, how do you know your program's effective and what are some of the things that you have in place to measure your programs? Ali, let's start with you. Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned before, this is a new program. So this program just started last January. We ran an eight month pilot. So we're still in kind of the first year of it. So my assistant, Andrew, and I always joke that our program's in infancy along with our babies. Um, <laughs> but when uh, kids are admitted to our program, we send them a baseline assessment and that baseline kind of covers developmental milestones for their age group. Um, then when they have a birthday, we will send them that same assessment. So say, for example, we have a six month old enter our program Program. When they turn 12 months, we will kind of resend them that same assessment to see if there's kind of been any growth in that area, as well as send them um, the assessment for the one to two year old to see where they are. And then at the end of the year, we will finish up the year by sending them that same assessment. So we have kind of the whole year's worth of kind of growth and data at that point. That, that's wonderful. And I think it's great that you already have that in place since, as you said, your program is an infant. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Ali. Um, Emily, tell us a little bit about your evaluation. Well, similarly, our program is fairly new, but we've been using since about 2016 something called the Scale of Motivation to Read Books from Catrancy 2010. You can get it on Google Scholar, and it's a scale of motivation and interest to read books. So the, the, the scale measures whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic motivation to read, and it also measures the strength of interest in reading. So we use that across all our programs. So we developed um, along with, uh, for this particular program, Books Beginning at Birth, and I'm, I'm putting the website on there in case anybody wants to see it. Um, uh, we have been working for several years with a researcher from Vanderbilt, and she's created a parent level question that is doing kind of the same thing that Ali is. It's kind of developing, going to measure everything across the milestones. So they get it before they get their first delivery of books, which, by the way, we are, it's all new purchased books through a variety of vendors and it's getting drop shipped to the families with a tip card. So before they get the first book, um, print books. Um, they get the pre, and then they're going to get a post, post, post about 30 days after they get each new set of books. Um, so she's going to be doing a longitudinal analysis of parents' perception of their children's oral language proficiency is the GERPA measure trickling down from the federal government that we're needing to measure on. We're measuring lots of other things and we're um, interested in engagement and quality. And there's lots of measures about how many books were downloaded and how many books were viewed and how long they were viewed for online. Um, so we've got a wealth of data, but um, the, really the core thing that we're really interested in is are we changing children's oral language proficiency um, against um, over time. Um, and there's been some talk about trying to do um, a random, uh, a, well, a matched comparison group. So it's a quasi experimental design. We haven't quite got that off the ground yet, but there's still enough time because we're still within the first year of the program. So um, it'll keep iterating as we go forward. What's great about our program is I know that we have funding through 2016 or uh, 2026 for it. And we're definitely working as an organization to continue funding after that period so that we can sustain this program. Emily, a follow-up question for you. Um, you mentioned this connection with the researcher at Vanderbilt, and you mentioned the, the parent survey, sort of the parent caregiver perceptions. 
are you doing any kind of assessments um, with the oral language with the child directly? We are not in it at scale. There's been talk about doing small focus groups and being able to do it like with a video, um, with video monitoring. But because our metric through the program is we've got to get to 80,000 children enrolled by year five, it's just not practical for us to do that with every child. So we may be doing it on a small basis for a small focus group, kind of a qualitative, like how is this changing the qualitative relationships of things? Um, but we're not doing it at scale for the whole program, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. And I also, I feel like I just want to lift up that point of your evaluation is fitting your program in terms of you're trying to go to scale. And so I think that's just a really important point in thinking through evaluation. Maytal, what would you like to add to this conversation about evaluation? Yeah, I, similar to what Emily just shared, we also have, of course, a wealth of data and quality improvement is a major focus of book babies. And uh, in terms of impact, we look at our um, key performance indicators that we measure um, with parental report. So we have a parent survey that goes out annually. We also have a book babies rubric that includes parental survey as well as coaches observations. And we're looking at the development in parent knowledge, self-efficacy uh, as it relates to early literacy, inclusion of early literacy practices at home and in family routines, and parent caregivers report an increase in their knowledge and access to the transition to school, as I mentioned earlier with pre-K and kindergarten. We have completed a randomized controlled trial in the past. We also uh, did focus groups with uh, book babies families and the um, qualitative, qualitative data from that was published in the Journal of Early Childhood Literacy uh, back in 2022. So there there's, has been a combination of evaluation and, and just a continuous um, data co collection and, and um, quality improvement. Thank you, Maytal. And I, you know, working with other nonprofit organizations that provide books to children more on a one-time basis, it's very hard to do some of these evaluations that you all are talking about. Um, so I think it's important just for us to know well, what can happen when you are providing books over time and sticking with that family unit. So thank you, um, all three of you, for sharing that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, of course, books. You know, how do you acquire books? Are you using brand new books? Um, what are the types of books that you're using for your program? Um, Amber, would you like to just tell us a little bit about the books that you all are using? Sure. So this program is really focused on brand new books. Um, we give out the same book to every child at the same age level for a period of two to three years um, so that every child is getting the same book at the same age. And that creates sort of a community need among toddlers, if there is such a thing. Um, we work directly with publishers to source most of our books. We get really good discounts when we go directly through the publisher and we buy in, you know, 750 to 1,000 books at a time generally. Um, but that allows us to really curate the titles we're getting instead of having to rely on what's available at first book or whatever in quantity. Um, we also are then able to create materials, companion materials for each book that are very specific to that book. Um, so using the same book for a period of time allows us to really get those materials um, on the mail and every family getting the same thing. Wonderful, thank you, Amber. Um, Allie, would you like to add to that? As of now, we kind of source all of our books through um, different vendor relationships that we have. Um, but as this program go grows, as it is growing pretty quickly, I would imagine that we'll be working kind of directly with publishers. So um, when we had chatted with this about this before, I was like, oh, I'm really curious to see what everybody else is doing. And I think that that might be the direction we'll probably move in. Wonderful. Thank you. Pam, what would you like to add? Um, our books, the in our prenatal program, the parents receive three different books from um, from Read to Grow. They're brand new books. Um, those books are uh, we have one book that um, supports ocular development for when the baby is first born. Um, those three books are brand new. They come from vendors um, that we we partner with. Um, our Welcome to the World is written directly for Read to Grow. Um, so it's our book and it's published just for us. Um, but that book is also piggyback. The parents sign up for what we call our follow-up program. So they get another book at three months and another book at a year. Um, those books are obviously, they come from, from vendors and, and different vendors that we use. 
And um, we also have what was written for from for Read to Grow. It's called um, The First Guide to Newborn Parents. Um, and it's a little insert that goes in there. It's published by us. Um, and it has all information about, you know, the importance of literacy, following you are your baby's first teacher. It's also reiterated um, that that first guide is also reiterated um, when the when we initially meet our, our parents in the hospitals. We have volunteers that deliver our message to those parents when they first meet them. We also have um, our nurses that work very hard in our clinics that also delivers our message about the importance of reading and 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 such. Wonderful, Pam. Thank you. And then I just wanted to add, um, Lauren had put in the chat. You know, she, they're new to connecting with the different publishers and vendors. Um, would either of you, would any of the panelists like to answer that in terms of how do you identify a point of contact and begin the relationship with a vendor? Who wants to take that? Most publishers have some sort of a community outreach person uh, who's responsible for those sorts of relationships. A lot of that can be found right on their websites. It's never a bad thing to just shoot an email to a contact form on a website, they will connect you to the right person. It's pretty easy. Yes. And I just want to echo that, Amber, is that they are looking for people who want their books. So they should be very responsive and um, get back to you right away. Thanks, Amber. Um, as we, in conclusion of this panel, I would love for you each to share a story or um, something else that you want the, the, the people on the call to hear today. I know that what you're doing is very unique in that you are connecting with families in this way over time. And um, I think it's just really important for people who are either thinking about this programming or kind of considering it for the future or also doing this, like what is unique about your program? What, what else do you want to share? Um, let's start with Amber for that. Um, so a story that I always love to tell about our program, we're, we're always uh, interested in kind of interfamily relationships and, and caregivers expanding, but because the same book is distributed community-wide at each age group, uh, it, it often stretches beyond that into daycares um, and pre-Ks. So we have a local pre-K or a local daycare that is focused on uh, refugee and immigrant families, and they have 12 kids enrolled speaking 12 different languages. And the teachers do not know any of those languages. Um, they're from all over the world. And we, I was teaching there at the time and we had a little boy who was very shy. He had just arrived in the country, didn't know any English. And he uh, was pretty withdrawn in the classroom. And one day he came in after having been at his first pediatric visit the day before and he had received his book, which was our two-year-old book. And he spotted it on the bookshelf in the front facing bookshelf. And he spotted this book on the shelf and he ran right over because he had it at home and it was familiar. And he hadn't really interacted much with the teachers but he ran right over with, to one of the teachers and they crawled up on the couch together and started looking at this book. And because all of the other kiddos in the class or most of the other kiddos had already received this book as well, it was familiar to them too. So it turned into this couch pile of, of toddlers all looking at the same book together. The teacher was able to read it in English and give them some vocabulary, but more importantly, the kiddos were able to point things out in their languages. And so the teacher was able to learn some of their own cues and words. Um, so it kind of goes beyond those family interactions too. It was really helpful for the teachers and the kiddos and it sort of built community in that classroom that is really hard to do when the kids can't communicate with each other very easily. That's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you so much, Amber. Pam, what would you like to share? Our program is very unique. We've been in, um, we've been servicing families for over 20 years now. And the one thing that I remember, um, even before I started working with Read to Grow is we have volunteers that go into the, the hospital rooms and they initially give our literacy packet to the moms. I received welcome to the world when I gave birth to my 16 year old daughter 16 years ago, which is amazing. So I now work for the program that my daughter received her very first book from. And, you know, it kind of, it holds a good place in your heart where everyone that I work with at Read to Grow, we're all moms. We're all after the same mission. We're all after the same things to promote literacy, to the joy of reading, to put books in the hands of children that sometimes don't have the income to do that, where they're worried about putting food on their table. So you can come to us and you can get a free book, a free brand new book here at Read to Grow. 
And it's just, it's just promoting the joy of reading and that literacy for families that have a difficult time trying to do that on their own. Thank you, Pam, for sharing that personal aspect. Allie. Um, we have a little girl who has been in our program since the start of the pilot. Um, and she was very disinterested in books. Um, this mom had expressed to us that her older son was also disinterested in books. And through like getting more books in the home through our program, through some of the programming we were doing and kind of just explaining to the mom that like, it's okay if it's on her terms and if she wants to walk away, then like just kind of circle back when she wants to explaining all of those things. Um, little Olivia loves books now um, and she will take books to mom. That's like their favorite family activity. Her mom showed me a video of her reading this little frozen book one time that just, um, so, and they're not alone, obviously. Obviously, it's other families that we work with in the program that have had similar stories. So stuff like that definitely fills my cup for sure, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ali. Emily. So one of our favorite stories is uh, in December, November, December, we got an email from one of the families and saying, you know, uh, my husband and I are both blind, but our child is sighted. Do you think that we could have a book that has both Braille and English in it so we could read out loud? to our child. And so Adali, who's our program lead, just got right on it immediately. And we got a package of books that was specifically for that need. And they were so grateful and they came to our zone story time. So like my overall thing with books beginning at birth as we scale, because we've done so much face-to-face -face things over time for a long time in Central Texas, how can we replicate that at scale or not replicate it, but how can we mirror it? How can we make choice part of the package that they're getting? So when we source the books, we're really trying to do it by topic and by level and by age so that they're getting things that reflect um, their culture, their home language and interests and they're in the interests of the child and the family. Thank you, Emily and Maytel. Um, I just like to, I guess, highlight that you know, Book Babies is an early literacy program that really centers families. It centers their experiences and their power. And we come in to provide the, the tools, which are those magnificent books and the information. And over that five-year-long partnership, we learn with them and from them the many ways in which, you know, together we we create those home literacy environments for, for the children and, and starting, of course, at birth. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ali, Maytal, Pam, Amber, and Emily for sharing these stories, for sharing more about your programs. And um, for those of you on the call, if you're interested in starting programming like this, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, and thank you so much. I really feel like these stories capture what it does mean to build a brighter world through books. These books are doing that. Um, so thank you so much for the work that you're doing.